Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben, and today we are going to break down the meaning of each of the death games in Squid Game. Spoiler alert, of course. As you know, Squid Game follows the story of a group of people who, drowning in debt and the many other troubles of life, are given the chance to escape the abominable state of their lives by participating in a competition which features a series of six children's games. Winning the competition presumably means winning enough money, some 46 billion won, to turn over a new leaf. But losing means dying. The star of the story is Gi Hun, a deadbeat dad who's in a bit of a financial mess, but who deep down is a warm-hearted person. The show is about his journey, that which takes place without and within, across the games and beyond. Now, if you're a fervent Generation Films fan, then you're probably asking, American Benjamin, why is this video not on Generation Ochi? your East Asian film and anime channel. You know, the one where you cover tons of Korean dramas? Well, if you like Squid Game, you should definitely head over there. Not only will you learn about more shows like it, but in a week or so, I'll have a video coming out on Ochi that covers every aspect of Squid Game's themes and hidden meanings. Anyway, on to today's diatribe, which concerns only the individual games. However, there are a few prerequisite points we need to make before discussing the games specifically. First, you have to understand that on a symbolic level, Squid Game concerns the economic plight of the masses and the cold capitalist system that imparts such burdens upon them. It's not anti-capitalist per se, it's not simple like that. The show is more just about how we've steered the ship awry more than it is a blatant political state. You can judge how valid its message is after listening to this video and more pertinently the video that comes out in a few days on Ochi. And within its message regarding people's economic woes, there's an overarching theme about childhood, specifically longing for and reminiscing about childhood. <laughs> 우리 초등학교 교실에 조개 탄 날로 있었잖아. 도시락 그 위에 깔아 놓으면 엄청 뜨거워져 가지고 막 누룽지 생기고. Characters from all walks of life and flavors of moral standing find solace in waxing romantic about their childhoods. Adult life is hard and the transition from adolescence into adulthood runs concurrent with one's revelation that the world can be a pretty dark place at times and that there's a lot of bastards out there. Thus, childhood becomes a memory of more innocent times, an age when the world was good and fun was the name of the game. And this is the point of the games in the show, to relive the good old days of unbridled fun. That's what game host Ilnam wants, but more on that in a bit as well as in the video on Ochi. The first game we see in the show is the red light green light game, a game that kids in the west play as well. The rules of the game dictate that players have to reach the goal across the field of play, but can only move when a giant doll at the finish line is turned away from them and singing red light, green light. If they get caught moving at the wrong time, they get tickled to death. Just kidding, they get shot by a tickle cannon. No, by a sniper rifle, actually. That shoots love! Not really. Anyway, the mass of players in the game have five minutes to go from point A to B, and anyone who fails to do so in that time limit will also be eliminated. Now, the first aspect of this game that hits me as important is the fact that the players have to watch others get killed and still go on. Perhaps this is a nod to what the experience of modern society is like. People see horrible things happen to the people around them, get used and abused and suffer, and yet still have to press on, fighting to compete. However, the most significant thing about Red Light Green Light has to do with strategy. The best way that one can survive this game is by hiding behind others and letting them take the fall. This offers us an analogous dynamic to what Gihun experienced at his former company. An unrestrained and properly controlled market creates a dog eat dog world within which to survive on the way to the top. You have to do some bad things to other people, perhaps let them take the blame for your blunders. It's tempting to be honest, but what's the reward for honesty? You become the goat, and not the good guy. There's an important image in this game of the immigrant saving the South Korean, holding him up rather than hiding behind him safely, despite his own pressing need for the prize money, or actually for any money at all. 
He comes from a different culture. Perhaps the show's creators mean to say a less selfish and soulless one, and so his impulse is to help his fellow man. For the record, I've been to South Korea, and its people are very gracious, giving, and welcoming, but I digress. The second game is called Sugar Honeycombs, or Pogi, named after a sweet, sugary, cookie-like snack sold by street vendors in Korea, some of whom give out prizes to the children who can successfully pluck out their given shape. Thus, in the show, each player must pick one of four shapes, a circle, triangle, star, or umbrella. Their chosen shape is the shape they must cut out within 10 minutes, and if they can't, or the cookie breaks, they'll be eliminated. You can start to see how the theme of childhood works its way into the story in contrast with adulthood. The game's rules are basically the same as they would be if it was played by children outside of the game arena in the show. But when kids play these games, they're just silly fun. When adults do, they turn them into blood-soaked struggles. Everything loses its innocence amidst the brutality of society. <laughs> Ilnam says he created in this time joined the game to relive the fun of his childhood. Yet he's not an innocent child anymore. And when this corrupted man recreates his childhood games, he turns them into something dark and violent. What makes Sugar Honeycomb significant is that it affords its players uneven starting points. Sure, the players choose their shapes, but they do so before they know what the rules of the game are. Thus, by no fault of their own, some players are beset with a much taller task than others, and when those with more complex shapes fail at the game, they understandably become apoplectic at the inequity. <laughs> Of course, in the outside world, there's great inequity as well, much of which is the product of people's starting points rather than life decisions alone. And perhaps we can infer that such people are oft blamed for their own failures despite starting with less. And then when they complain, it gets them nowhere but in trouble. The third game is Tug of War. This game is fairly self-explanatory. Two teams stand on either side of a platform raised high above a hard floor and try to pull the other team down to their deaths. This game is important because an inevitable outcome as a product of its rules is that some people have to die. In society, there has to be some losers in order for others to win. And often, people who don't want to fight or kill others have to do so in order to save themselves and rise. And after Gihan's team wins their match, we witness the trauma this type of vicious competition causes. People live with the guilt of their harmful actions, those which the system backs them into on the path to success. In this case, the players had no choice. It was kill or be killed. And the show is saying that's often the deal in modern money-worshipping societies. People are pushed to cultivate the darker side of their natures or simply to go against their natures altogether. The fourth game is a game of marbles. The players are told to make teams of two and are each given a pouch filled with 10 marbles. The players are then told they will compete against their chosen teammate and must figure out some way to take all of their opponent's marbles in order to win. This game is important for a few reasons. One, it tests the limits of human selflessness, if such a thing even exists. Prior to this game, Gihun chooses to team up with the old man because he feels bad for him. But then when he learns the rules and struggles to beat his opponent, he cheats and attempts to trick him. Can we blame him? Can we even blame Song Wu for tricking Ali? Their lives are on the line. When your death is imminent, you may not be so selfless either. The show is saying that the market puts people in such positions sometimes where they must lift the veil of cordiality and engage their survival instincts. Become the animal, if you will. The game also reveals people's true sentiments and intentions because it guarantees that one's opponent will die. There's a facade of niceness, as I just alluded to, that drapes over society, but it's somewhat insincere and it hides away the negative thoughts and emotions of its denizens. Fear, jealousy, anger, envy, and so on. 
This game lets the beast go free because there are no consequences, no obvious consequences at least, to showing one's hidden self. It's also important to note that this game highlights how bad behavior is rewarded in society and sometimes can be justified, not because it's moral, but because of systemic dysfunction. The fifth game is called Glass Stepping Stones. The rules are as follows. The players each select a number among 1 to 16 on a mannequin. They then walk into a room where there's a glass bridge spanning a divide high above the floor below. Each stepping stone on the bridge is made of one of two types of glass, tempered or normal glass. The tempered glass will hold the weight of up to two players at once, but the regular glass will break if just one person steps on it. The players thus have to cross the bridge in the order corresponding with their mannequin number and guess which stepping stones provide the correct path to the other side. The person who goes last obviously has the biggest advantage because he gets to see everyone else go first and ideally break most of the normal glass stones by the time he has to cross them. On the part of the players, what stands out to me about this game is that Duck Su, the murderous gangster of the group, sort of breaks the rules and gets away with it. When it's his turn to cross, with much of the bridge still uncharted, he forces another player to go ahead of him instead. Duck Su simply intimidates others to do as he wants. He's the nastiest player, and so this provides him some advantages in the market. Though Duck Su does later perish due to his reluctance to move, but mostly because he pisses the craziest person in the show off. However, what seems most important to me about this game is the control the game masters hold over it. When one of the players figures out a way to determine which glass is tempered and which isn't using light and sound, the front man turns off the lights on the bridge. He changes the game when it isn't producing the outcome he wants. I suppose the analogy we can draw here is that the elites of the market, specifically in the business world, simply change the rules when the little guy figures out how to beat them. Robin Hood shutting down purchases of GameStop shares during the GameStop short squeeze earlier this year is a prime example of this. We also see in this game how the players, as in the masses, are just playthings to be toyed with by the elites. Their destinies are decided by the rich and powerful, and there's no real effort to uphold any sort of rules or standards of fairness for everyone. Sabiok plays by the rules and beats the game, and yet in a spot where she's supposed to be safe, she gets impaled by glass shrapnel as the bridge explodes. I think she's owed some serious workers' comp. Instead, she just has to keep playing on. The sixth and final game is Squid Game. The rules go like this. There are two players, well, at least in this specific game, one who is assigned the position of offense and the other defense based on the outcome of a coin toss. The two players then position themselves on a sort of abstract chalk drawing of a squid, the offensive player at the base of the squid and the defensive player within the squid. The offensive player or attacker must run past the defense and tap the squid's head with his foot to win. However, the attacker is given a handicap. He can only hop on one foot until he crosses the squid's neck. The defender, on the other hand, can win by pushing the attacker out of the drawing altogether. Additionally, if there comes a situation where either player cannot continue playing, then that player is eliminated and the other one wins. Here's the thing about Squid Game. While it seems sort of complicated at first, all it really is by its end is a bare knuckles fight to the death. Which, when stripped of its sophisticated facade, is all society is. Or at least all it has become in its unrestrained, capitalistic, greedy state. Gi-hun and Sang-woo just beat the crap out of each other. If kids were playing it, perhaps this wouldn't be so. Sang-woo recognizes this as he lays distraught on the ground. <laughs> 형이랑 이러고 놀다 보면 꼭 엄마가 밥 먹으라고 불렀는데 이제는 아무도 안 부른데. Childhood is pure, innocent, free of the lasting troubles of adulthood. And at this point in their lives, with society the way it is, Squid Game just can't be the same. It can't be like it was when they were kids, and neither can the world at large. Anyway, that's my breakdown of the meaning of the games. I definitely recommend that if you enjoyed Squid Game, that you should head over to Generation Ochi, where in a few days I'll be publishing a much more comprehensive analysis of the show. If you did like this video, though, please do give it a big thumbs up. Definitely comment down below. Let me know what you think, what you agree with, disagree with. Remember to subscribe to this channel, of course and hit that damn notification bell so you don't miss a damn thing. For now, my name is American Ben, 
and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.